welcome to Healthy Minds, uh, a show where we talk about mental health issue. Your host today, uh, I'm Phyllis Strickland, and this is my husband, Juan Edward Strickland, and we're going to talk about some issues that are related to mental illness. When you have to make a phone call because your loved one is in crisis. We're not doctors, we're not therapists, we are uh, family members of a loved one who's had mental illness, and unfortunately, or fortunate as the case may be, we have had to use the involuntary um, hospitalization process with our son. So we're speaking from our loved ex uh, lived experience. And so let's talk about making the phone call. Uh, not to a friend, but to a psychiatric emergency team or law enforcement. Um, I remember the, the day, as if it was yesterday, when our son was very agitated, um, seemed to be exhibiting threatening behavior, and was very agitated. And we had to make a decision to approach him about getting help. And we were fortunate enough that he was willing to voluntarily allow us to take him to the emergency room. And that's not always the case. A lot of times your loved ones are in denial, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But getting the person to someone who can intervene is critical. The timing is critical. Um, action has to be taken. The loved one will often not call the police, or they won't go voluntarily. So most um, cities have a police department that hopefully has been educated about the mentally ill, or you can call crisis teams. They're sometimes called pet teams to come and get your loved one for that evaluation. And if you do have to call law enforcement, give them a heads up <coughs> that you have a loved one that has a history of mental illness. Um, often yeah. there's a feeling of abandonment. Uh, there are reasons why family members won't call. Um, and it's denial, a feeling of abandonment, frustration, uh, even panic, anxiety. And you're afraid that that loved one is going to stop loving you. They're going to blame you. What if, what if something goes wrong in this process? You're so afraid. But we've, um, Juan and I also teach a family-to-family -family class under NAMI, National Alliance of Mentally Ill, <clears throat> excuse me, illness, and we've heard people say that when they did make that call, there have been really tragic consequences. Uh, for example, we know someone who there were guns in the home and the family failed to make that phone call and unfortunately there was a, a tragedy thereafter. Um, it's hard, but as a family member, you've got to act because it could save your loved one's life or it could save the life of a family member. And I know our son, once he got to the ER room, it took um, about seven professionals including law enforcement to restrain him. And he felt abandoned, he felt anger, he felt resentment, um, he felt embarrassment. And he even cried out to us asking why, we, why were we allowing these professionals to do this to him? So it was very painful for us as well. And, and, and uh, I wanna interject mm -hmm. about that because that was such a process. We went into the emergency room and he was asking us a lot of questions. Why are you taking me here? Why are you doing this? Nothing is wrong. So he's in a state of denial. We're in a state of fear. And so we get to the emergency room. And because he was an adult at the time, um, we couldn't, quote, check him in. He had to agree to see the doctor. And he would not allow us to talk to the doctor. But we were prepared and had something already typed up about the current behavior and other information that we had so that we, even because of HIPAA laws, we might not be able to go into the room or talk to the doctor. We can hand the professional something so that they have some background information. Because even though he was agitated, he probably was smart enough to talk his way out of it. The second thing I want to share with you all is, um, so we're waiting for this assessment to happen in the emergency room and we're on pins and needle and he's pacing. And at a certain point, he said, I'm leaving. And so we're back. He allowed us to come back, my son, into the emergency area. And the doctors came, or the person, the health professionals came and said, we're going to take him down. We're going to have to restrain him. And I almost wanted my husband to leave the room because I just knew how traumatic that was going to be. And when they came, they sort of signaled each other. We knew it was about to happen. It was about seven people, I think. And he screeched out, he yelled, Dad. 
because they had every arm and every limb and it just was pain so painful. And we cried and was wondering, did we do the right thing? I mean, we knew we had done the right thing. And so they were able, they restrained him and gave him medication. And it took several um, injections over time to calm him down. But they did find that he was dangerous to self or potentially dangerous to others. And so he was admitted under this involuntary hold. So talk about the 72 hour hold. Um, he was, and I think some of our professionals have already uh, discussed on another segment about the 72 hour hold, but the initial hold was for seven, up to 72 hours where the uh, medical team will evaluate the loved one to see if they remain dangerous to self or others. Because on day one they could be dangerous to self and be suicidal, but by that third day not. And if so, if they don't meet the criteria, they have to be discharged. And so, if we could fast forward for a second, um, making a long story short, our son actually was uh, discharged after 72 hours, and he actually had final exams coming up in two weeks, and he passed all his classes. And think about what happened there. I mean, we were able to fight through this process get him help. And no one would have ever thought on the other side he would be able to come through this after just what had happened. Right. And finish school and pass final exams. So the so in so in summary, take the step. It's difficult, it's hard. Get someone that'll support you if you need that, but please save your loved one's life or someone else's life and change the trajectory of what's happening in the crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much.